Welcome. Thank you for joining us today, both in the room and online. I uh, step back, that's kind of backstage here behind the curtains, and uh, I got a text from a friend, and he said, man, we're watching you online today. And uh, he said, my wife's got a cough. And um, so I, I appreciated that. And we do have a lot of folks that do that. And uh, I want us to pray today as we begin this message, because I'm going to be speaking on this subject today, resurrecting a dead spiritual life. Now, by dead spiritual life, we don't mean that you're not a Christian. Do you know that in the past couple of years with the pandemic, um, that over 50% of people who used to go to church quit going? We're not talking about people that went Christmas and Easter. We're talking about people that went every week. And uh, I just read this week an article that said that 42% of pastors in this nation right now are considering quitting the ministry. I'm not talking about going to another church, but completely quitting because they're so discouraged. And I believe that Jesus gives us the answer. Uh, What we're going to read today, Jesus spoke to a church nearly 2,000 years ago, and I believe he gave the answer to resurrecting a spiritual life that feels dead. And look, we all go through it, no matter how spiritually awake you are, or in tune you feel, or how good you feel about your relationship with God, there will be times, I promise you, that it feels dead. It feels lifeless. It feels like you're not connecting. It feels like when you pray that your prayers don't go any higher than the ceiling. And so I want us to begin today by praying for pastors across this nation, praying for people, Christians across this nation who have, um, and I'm not talking about connecting online, I'm talking about people that have just completely quit, good people, good Christian people. And uh, so we want to pray that God resurrects not just us and not just those watching, but we want to pray that God resurrects people across this nation and resurrects pastors across this nation because it's critical. It is critically important that people have pastors to lead them and to teach them the Word of God and to keep them focused where their life should be focused. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, first of all. We thank you that no matter what we go through, you have the answer. No matter what struggle we may have, you have the answer. And Lord, I pray specifically for pastors across this nation that you would encourage them, not just this nation, but across the world, that you would put wind in their sails, that you would help them and uh, give them a, a resurrected spiritual life, a reconnection with your purpose, a reconnection with your will. I pray for the many Christians in this nation, Lord, that have struggled, especially in the last couple of years. God, that you would empower them that you would resurrect them, that you would reconnect them to you. And Father, we want, to know, we want you to know that we love you today, and we thank you for all that you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, let's look today in Revelation chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 6. This is the fifth church that we've looked at that Jesus spoke directly to, and he told them some things. And today we're going to read uh, what Jesus said to the church in Sardis. That was a city in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and uh, it was a real church, a real group of people. And just so you'll know, the church that he was speaking to was very large. In fact, it was one of the largest churches in the ancient world. In fact, the synagogue... And and that's where many of them met. Uh, The synagogue was where Jewish people met. But in the early church, the majority of believers, of followers of Jesus Christ, were Jewish people that had received Jesus as the Messiah. Their um, synagogue was as large, get this, as a football field. That is a very 
very, we're not talking about Sunday school space. We're not talking about, you know, a family life center. We're not talking about a gym. We're talking about an auditorium that was the size of a football field, large church. And yet, what Jesus said to them, I think applies to us today. Uh, verse number one of chapter three, and to the angel, remember we said the angel is the pastor, it's the word messenger, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now get that. Once again, Jesus is not commenting on the size of the church. There's certainly nothing wrong with having a very large church. Um, that there are many advantages to that often. But it doesn't have anything to do with the size of the church. He is talking to them about a spiritual life that has cooled off. And so he says, I know that you have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. Did you notice the emphasis that Jesus talks about? Strengthen what's remain, what remains, keep it, wake up. So he's telling this church that they need to wake up spiritually speaking, that they need to reconnect. They need to get their heart on fire for God. Once again, we don't operate on emotions Though God has given us emotions, and there's certainly nothing wrong with being emotional, but we don't make all of our decisions based on how we feel. To be honest, there are some days I don't feel very connected to God. There are some days I feel like I'm just like disconnected. There are some days that I feel better than others. There are some days that I feel like, man, I, my heart is on fire. Uh, I love the Lord with all of my heart. And there are some days that I'm like, Meh. You know what I'm talking about? You ever been there? You ever had a meh day? I mean, you just kind of wake up and it's like, you know, uh, you, you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. You wake up a little grouchy. Uh, you can't get enough coffee. You're late to work. And it's just one of those meh days, you know? Well, we don't base our relationship with God on that kind of emotion but we do know in our heart when we feel that the distance in our relationship with God is increased. So that's just what Jesus is talking about to this church. He said, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. And here he's talking about complacency. This idea that he's coming like a thief is not that he's coming in judgment it's that when they were unaware, they're going to be taken uh, off guard. And often that's what happens to us as believers. Have you ever noticed that? We are really connected. We're on fire for God. And then we wake up one day and we're like, how did I get here? I mean, I didn't make a decision to get disconnected. I didn't make a decision. It feels like I've taken steps away from God. I didn't make a decision to do that. I just kind of woke up unaware one day and it felt like that's where I was. That's what Jesus is talking about to them. He says, yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I'm going to give you just a challenge today. When we look at what Jesus was saying, he was talking about a church that was becoming spiritually dead. They, were, they had a great reputation. He said, you've got a reputation that you're alive, but you're really dead. Now, I don't want you to start thinking, well, I know churches like that that are dead. And I got to be honest with you, uh, we often don't know based on what goes on in their programming. And let me just give you an example. Uh, when my family first really started going to church, 
My dad and mom and my family, we had moved from North Carolina where I was born and spent most of my life growing up. And my dad's job moved him uh, to South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina. We lived there for about two and a half years. There was a church that we started going to there. That's where my dad got really on fire for God. He started working and volunteering in youth ministry, became a deacon, and later became a pastor, okay? So God really worked in his heart in this church. But I got to describe this church to you. Most of you probably would not like it. I can remember one of the oddest things that I thought when I first went there was that the piano player for the church was blind. Now, don't feel sorry for her. She was one of the greatest pianists I have ever heard. She was incredible. But this church was very formal. Do you know what I'm talking about? You go in, you get the bulletin, and every word is kind of planned out, and you have the order. Oh, the pastor is going to say this now. We're going to sing this song now. It was that church, but it was more than that because the music, especially the special music, was what I kind of thought was operatic. You know what I'm talking about? Woo! You know, they're doing that up there, and uh, they don't hold the mic, but they act like they're doing an opera or something. And to be honest, it was not very exciting, okay? I mean, for me, it wasn't very exciting because we didn't really have children's church to this church, and I had to go in the service with my parents, and there were times, to be honest, as a seven to 10-year-old boy, that I was really, really, really bored. Well, then my dad, his job moved him back to North Carolina, and we started going to this church um, that I spent my formative years in, uh, age 10 to when I graduated from high school. And I got to tell you, the first time we ever went to this church was quite an experience. It was a country church. But by that, they, they, they were very informal. Uh, they never even filled out a visitor's card for anybody. It was really a strange church. It was a very large church, especially for a country church that was completely and totally disorganized. I'm, I'm not kidding you. If you hated organized religion, you would have loved this church because it was so disorganized. I've never, even as a 10-year-old boy, I'm like, man, they need to get their act together, you know? Well, the first time we visited this church, I got to tell you, um, the, the music in this church was something um, because they had, this is, I'm talking about in the 70s, they had an electric guitar player that would make Jimi Hendrix jealous, okay? I mean, he's like moving around in this uh, white and gold guitar, and it was really incredible. They had drums. They had bass players. Uh, they had an organ and a piano, odd kind of mix, to be honest. Uh, they had horn players. And I'm not making this up. I know you probably think I'm lying about this, but I'm not. I promise you, I'm telling you the truth. They had people that played the spoons. You know, I've never seen anything like it, okay? So I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is so much better than going to an opera, you know? And I'm sitting there kind of into it, you know? And all of a sudden, a woman behind me stands up, and she's got a white handkerchief in her hand, and she starts screaming at the top of her lungs. I literally crapped my pants, okay? As a 10-year-old boy, it scared me to death. I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know if she was having a heart attack. I thought maybe she saw a snake or something because, you know, as things were going, I'm like, yeah, this place might have snakes, okay? But actually, she just was praising the Lord. Now, that church was extremely, extremely odd when it comes to rules and things of that nature. Um, Because it was in North Carolina, and there were a lot of tobacco farmers in the church, uh, and tobacco was the cash crop, it's what paid for everything, Uh, you'd have 12, 13, 14-year-old boys smoking on the front steps of uh, of the church. Um, If you wanted to come into the church, you had to go through a cloud of smoke, all right? Uh, But yet they had odd rules like you could not go to a movie or to a skating rink. I'm not sure what a bowling alley had uh, that was anti-Jesus, but you couldn't go there. They had some of the strangest rules. Now, my point is this, and don't miss the point. You can look at a church 
on the outside and say, boy, that's a dead church. Well, the church that I described that used the operatic type singers, they were not a dead church. That's where my dad really got on fire for God. So they were evangelistic. It was not a dead church. The church that I just told you about that had all the crazy stuff going on and people standing and shouting and, you know, seeing snakes or whatever uh, in the service. I got to be honest with you, that church as well, though it was odd, they had an evangelistic fervor to see people come to know Jesus Christ. And so when we talk about resurrecting a dead spiritual life, I don't want you to think about a church. I want you to think about you. I don't want you to think about somebody else. Well, I tell you what, oh, so-and-so, she needs to hear this message. And she might, but you need to hear it as well. And so today, I'm going to just give you three points from this text that I think will show us how we can resurrect a dead spiritual life or a spiritual life that feels like it's dying. Here's the first point. We want to see the problem. What was their problem? Well, their problem was that they were dying spiritually. They were a big church. They had a reputation that a lot of people thought it was a great church. But Jesus told them, he said, look, you're dying. You need to pay attention to what's going on. You see, they had a reputation of being alive. And you know what their problem was? It was style over substance. Now, I got to warn you that churches can be guilty of this just like this church was. You see, if all we are concerned about is our style, our lights, our music, the kind of music we do, that we're worried about, well, we'll do more modern music than this church does, and therefore we're better. That's style over substance. I've got to be honest with you, and we have our music and our programming for a specific reason. We believe it's the best way to reach people that we're trying to reach. But I've got to be honest with you. Jesus is not impressed with the style of music in a church. He is impressed with our heart. He is impressed with how we connect with him, how we listen. Not if you're perfect. We say all the time, this church is the, the perfect place for imperfect people. If you're perfect, you probably won't fit in here. The truth is, we want our church to be this way. Our mission, uh, bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We believe that life is messy. If we're going to reach people, we got to reach people that have problems. Because even when you come to church, you got problems. A lot of times we kind of cover it up. We pretend. We act like we don't have problems, but we all have problems. And so I want you to understand that we must, as a church, not worry so much about the style. Now, once again, I really don't believe that there are people in our community that think this. Boy, if I could find me a church where the pastor didn't wear a tie, I'd go get saved. I don't think that thought has ever occurred to anyone. Now, now we do dress casually because we feel like it's more inviting okay, that it's more welcoming. But the truth is, if I wore a tuxedo, or if I wore, like some pastors do in some denominations, robes and a a backwards collar and all this, it doesn't matter. God is not impressed by that. What he is interested is that a church and that an individual is more concerned about substance than style. And this is what God has called us to do. And so, there's the problem, okay, that in a nutshell. Now, I want you to notice the process. That's the second point. Jesus gave them a process. He said, look, here's your problem. You got a reputation for being alive, but you're really dead. You know it. Uh, Strengthen what remains. Hold on to it. Uh, Get back into the game, so to speak. And then he goes on and shows us how to do that. He talks about uh, that he is the one that has the seven spirits of God. Now that, don't think that there's anything weird about that. That's really referring, all theologians believe this, and there are some things it could refer to, but every theologian believes that ultimately this is referring to the Holy Spirit of God, okay? So we have a clue right off the bat 
if we want to get our heart revived, if we want to get closer to God, if we want to make sure that we are not dead but alive spiritually, the Holy Spirit is the key, the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus told them that they must allow the Holy Spirit to work in their lives. Now, I want to just give you two thoughts here about this process, about number one, discovering if your heart needs to be warmed and how to fix it. The first thing is this, you got to take inventory in your life. Listen to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, now here's a little test. You got to take inventory. You got to ask yourself these questions. Does this represent how I live? Does this describe my relationship? Not just with God. Anybody, listen, anybody can look like they have a good relationship with God in church. You can wave your hands, you can clap, you can cry, you can sing, you can get all into it emotionally. But the real question is not, as an old pastor I heard one time say, it's not how you jump, it's how you walk after you land. And for a lot of people, man, it's all exciting in church and you have that, that beautiful relationship, but then during the week, what is your relationship with God like. So, don't judge these questions, this inventory, by how you act and feel at church, but rather how you act and feel during the week. Now, let's just look at these questions. Do you love, he said, the spirit, the fruit of the spirit is love. Do you love lost people and others and the unlovable? If not, maybe Jesus is speaking to your heart that it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we increase our love. Now, what he's saying there is if you're going to be filled and controlled by the Spirit of God, you're going to love people that you wouldn't normally love. You're going to be able to have a love for lost people especially. Uh, As you look at people around you, it's easy to get disgusted, isn't it? Because if we take a moralistic approach to our relationship with God, and and trust me, I believe in morals, okay? But the truth is, when you look at some of the nonsense that's going on in our culture today, why are we surprised that non-Christians don't act like Christians? So the question is, can you love people like that with the love of God? The ability to share God's love with them and to express it in a way that may be contrary to the way you feel inside apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Here's the second thing. Do you have joy in challenging circumstances? That's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, the fact is we can get angry and frustrated and upset. And and I'm not saying you have to walk around like, I've seen some people do this and I think it's fake and I think it's really weird. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today? And they're the kind of people, they hit their thumb with a hammer, and they're like, oh, praise Jesus. No, that's not normal. That's not what he's talking about. And if you want to know what I say, if I hit my thumb with a hammer, I'm not going to say it in church, okay? I might write it down and let you see it, but I'm not going to say it to you. And so he's not talking about that, but he's talking about joy in difficult circumstances. Do you have that? If not, maybe you need to strengthen what remains in you, just like he said. The power of the Holy Spirit. Do you have peace in the storm? Did you know that God is more interested in calming you than he is in calming the storm? You need to get that. God is more interested in calming his children than he is calming the wind and the waves. Maybe exactly what you need is the wind and waves in your life right now. But what God wants to do is to calm you. The question is, do you have peace 
anybody can have peace when everything's perfect. You're sitting on the beach, you've forgotten all your problems, you've had one too many Mai Tais, you know, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm feeling good. I got peace right now because of the sun setting and all that. Well, that's not peace. Do you have peace in the storm? That's when you know if you have peace or not. Then he goes on, uh, are you patient in difficulty? That's a tough one. I need help with that. I'm not very patient. If you pray for patience, you may be like the guy that said, Lord, give me patience, but give it to me right now. Are you kind? That's one of the fruits of the Spirit. Are you being kind? Uh, Are you generous with others? Did you know that the word goodness in this text is defined as relationship goodness? It is defined as the act of generous giving. And it's uh, concerned with the welfare of others. Now, let me ask the question again. Does that characterize you or do you need a little help with the Spirit of God? Do you need to come alive spiritually speaking? Because maybe you've stopped caring about others. You've stopped being generous in relationships with others. Are you faithful? That's a good question. Are you, not just to your job, are you faithful in the spiritual disciplines? Are you faithful to church? Are you faithful in serving God with your life? Are you steady? You see, a lot of people think that what God's looking for is like an explosion. All of a sudden, you have an experience with God, and life explodes with activity and goodness and kindness and all these things. Now, you know what the Christian life is? It's every day taking a little step. That's why we say here, your next step is your most important step. God is interested in you taking a step today, a step tomorrow. So the question becomes, do we need revival in our life with faithfulness and gentleness? The word gentle, it means not being overly impressed with your own importance. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I know all of you here that you don't argue with your spouse or with your family at all because you're always concerned about their welfare, about their position more than you are your own, right? Anybody like that? Are there liars that are willing to raise your hand in church? Remember Revelation. We're studying Revelation. It says all liars are going to go to hell, okay? So, look, the point is, if we're not careful, uh, we'll stop being gentle. He's not talking about being, oh, real nice. He's talking about being concerned for the welfare of others. And then the last thing there, this taking inventory Do you have self-control? Do you know that's the ninth fruit of the Spirit, that you have self-control? You ever said this or thought this? Well, I just can't help it. That's the way I am. Not according to the Bible. Not according to the Holy Spirit. Even if you're an impatient person, He can bring you to life spiritually. Even if you're a person that has no self-control, maybe when it comes to your temper, or maybe when it comes to spouting out your opinion and ruining Thanksgiving for everybody. Or, Or maybe it's that like, you know, you can't control what you eat. Or maybe it's you can't control what you look at or you think you can't. And when nobody is around, you're like looking at stuff that you shouldn't look at, and you think, I just don't have any self-control. Not according to the Word of God. If you are a believer, maybe you are dying spiritually, and you need to take inventory in this area, but God says that the fruit, you know that fruit is something that only God produces You can plant a seed, you can water that seed, you can prune it, you can cultivate it, but there's one thing that you cannot do. You cannot grow an apple. You cannot grow a peach. Maybe I should use that one, uh, being in the peach state. You know why? Because that's only God's area. Only God can do that. And the point of Galatians 5 is this, when you take inventory... Only God does these things in your life. If you think that what I need to do now is white knuckle it and just, you know, sew my mouth shut so I don't spew off at the mouth at the wrong time or or whatever that's based on your self-effort. God's not against effort. 
But according to this, even when you take inventory, you know what God's doing? He's saying, I am the one that will help you strengthen those things that remain. So you got to take inventory, uh, and then you've got to take action. You see, it's one thing to take inventory, find out where you are. It's another thing, this is part of the process, you got to learn to take action. And he says, be more concerned with what God sees than with what people think. In other words, don't worry so much about your reputation and worry more about your soul. You know what, we're in this culture with social media, and I'm afraid that there is a lesson that so many people are learning, especially young people, that is devastating to our souls. They're worried about likes and reputation and what people think. And there are some that are devastated if not many people like their picture. Well, that, that, is, that is wrenching to the soul. And you know what God said? And before there was ever social media, this is interesting. He said, you need to be more interested on the inside than the outside. That, that's what God says. You want to get alive again? Work on the inner man more so than the outer man. Don't be concerned as much with your reputation or the number of followers that you have. Then you work on the private life more than the public, public life. The, the words wake up, when he told them to wake up, that word, it's interesting. The, word, the words mean to be. Wake up. I, now, if, I, if somebody tells me to wake up, maybe I've fallen asleep. I don't think of what I'm becoming or to be. That's not what I think of. I think of, where's my coffee, right? That's what I think of. But you know what this word that Jesus told them was very interesting. He said, you got to be something before you think about doing something. Now, now, please don't misunderstand. He's not suggesting you have to be perfect. He's not suggesting that you have to be complete in any area, to be honest, to serve. This idea that you need to turn over a new leaf and got to work on all these things before you can do anything for God is simply not true. So he's not suggesting wait until you are completely perfect and spiritually mature. But while you are working, while you are doing, here's what he's saying, you got to be more interested in being than in doing. Now, I can apply this to every area of our church. Are you more interested in being the right person than you are in where you serve? Now, we want people to be nice with guest services. You got to be a greeter. You got to smile. Uh, you got to be happy and welcoming. But you know what God's saying? That during this, while you're doing this, be more concerned with being than with simply doing. And let me put it another way. Have you ever just simply gone through the motions? We all have. And there are times you've got to go through the motions because you don't really feel like doing it, right? Well, you know what God's saying? He said, don't just go through the motions. Remember what I have done. Strengthen what remains. And he tells them to remember, to keep it. And that's how you strengthen your soul. Then he says, uh, really get involved in church. The, The phrase strengthen what remains, it means to fix in place. To support. To establish. Strengthen that foundation. I know of no other way to get more established as a believer than coming together in a community and worshiping God. And hearing the Word of God taught. Acts chapter 2 talks about it. It's incredible what happens when you have a dynamic group of people. And they don't have to be the sharpest tools in the shed. They don't have to be the elite of society. It's just that other believers help you make that jump from just doing to being. And then he tells us, uh, finish what God has called you to do. He said, complete the works. Now, let me ask you a question. Are you finishing what God has called you to do? 
Now, I realize that sometimes you'll get involved in a ministry, you start volunteering, and it doesn't feel like, eh, that's not really what I think I like best. And that's okay. We're not saying that you can't change. But are you finishing? More so in the personal life. More so in the family life. Are you finishing what God has called you to do? God wants you to run the race. He doesn't call you to be perfect. And if that is the stumbling block in front of you, then allow the Holy Spirit to remove that because God's interested in steps. He's not interested in perfection. When he looks at you, by the way, if you think I'm making this up, when he looks at you as a believer, he sees the blood of Jesus Christ. You are justified in the eyes of God. That's the only possible way you could go to heaven. Your sin has already been judged on the cross through Jesus Christ. He took the wrath of God for you and for me. And so today, you need to be one of those believers that doesn't stumble at perfection, doesn't stumble at reputation, doesn't stumble at what other people think about you, but you're going to get in the race and you're going to do what the apostle Paul said. He said, I have finished my race. That's what God has called us to do. And so don't be so worried about perfection. And then you want to do this, recall and rehearse God's forgiveness and salvation and mercy and grace. He said, remember what or how you received and heard. This is interesting. Um, One of the ways to encourage your soul is to remember not just the what. Jesus saved me. Yes, I remember that. But remember the how. Now, he's not asking you to compare your present time with that. But remember how you felt when you gave your life to Jesus Christ? I was just an eight-year-old boy. And I remember after praying to receive Christ, my mother was praying with me beside my bed before I got in bed before she tucked me in. And I can remember even as an eight-year-old boy. Now, I would not been, you know, I wasn't a member of a gang. I'd never stolen a car. I'd never been in prison. You know, I was just an eight-year-old kid. But I remember the feeling that the weight of the world had rolled off of me. You remember that? You remember how it felt? Maybe what you need to do is not remember the slight that somebody gave you this week, not remember how somebody made a bad comment about you this week, how somebody offended you this week. And maybe, just maybe, you need to remember what it was like when your life was transformed by the power of God. I tell you, you remember that? You're going to operate with grace. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to feel stronger. You got to change your thinking by reading the Word of God. He said to keep it, it means to keep in view or keep it in front of your eyes. Spend time with God. That's what he's saying. So you want God to work in your life? Spend time with God. Read the Bible and pray. When you read the Bible, ask God to reveal something to you. Ask God to speak to you. I promise you, He will. Uh, Listen to good sermons on podcasts or whatever. Um, It can encourage you. So, I've got two minutes and 30 seconds left, okay? You say, how can you be that specific? How long do you know you're going to speak? Because it's right there on that screen, all right? So, that's how long I'm going to speak. The last point is this. We, we, We talked about the problem. We talked about the process of getting the problem fixed. Now, let's look at the promise. He said... The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Now, once again, just as a reminder, all of these promises to these churches were found in Jesus Christ. In other words, when he says the one who conquers, the one who endures, the one who conquers and and lasts and so forth, he's not talking about your effort. He's saying the one that has trusted me by faith because I am the one who's conquered. I am the one who finishes the race. I am the one that helps you and empowers you. So when you read that, don't think that he's saying, boy, if you don't finish this, you're not going to go to heaven. That's not what he's saying at all. He's giving you the promise, and and here, here they are. He promised to be with you no matter what you go through. He promised to remind you of your forgiveness and your justification. 
God has forgiven you. God has saved you. You need to remember that. Ask God to remind you. And then Jesus reminds us of our eternal security and gives us the confidence of our salvation. Do you know what I know? And I've been pastoring for a long time now. I know that Christians that are confident that God is with them, confident in their salvation, they're the ones that do better. They're the ones that finish the race. They're the ones that get through the difficulty. You know why? Because they are encouraged, not by their steps, but the fact that Jesus is carrying them. And that's what he's saying. I got 16 seconds left, so I'm gonna stop. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the love of God. Thank you for this process that if we'll just take inventory and we can take action, we, you promised that you would help us, that we could strengthen what remains. Before I finish my prayer with heads bowed, let me ask you this simple question. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? How many would say, just by lifting your hand, God's speaking to me about something. Maybe you, there's an area of your life you need to get warmer, that you need to get closer to God. Maybe there's something you're praying about. But you'd say, God spoke to me today, and I want you to pray with me today. Would you just raise your hand? Anybody like that? A lot of, a lot of hands, a lot of hands. Father, I pray that you'd help everyone here that's struggling or or thinking about something, or needing to be drawn closer to you, that you'd be with them. And with our heads bowed, I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I need Jesus as my Savior. I need to be saved. Well, online or in the room, let me just encourage you, you can just say yes to Jesus. You can pray and ask him, he said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if God has been working in your life and you feel like you need that relationship with God, why don't you pray something like this? Dear Jesus, I believe that you're the son of God, that you died on the cross and rose again and are alive today. And I thank you that you died for my salvation and I'm asking you today to save me right now. If you prayed that prayer today in the room, would you just raise your hand? Pastor, I prayed that prayer today to receive Jesus as my Savior. Anyone uh, that prayed that prayer online, hit the button at the bottom, and you'll be able to record that, and, and we'll know that you prayed to receive Christ today. If God is speaking to you about some area of spiritual discipline or becoming awake, waking up, getting closer, examining the inside person more than the outside reputation, my encouragement to you is to pray during this time and ask God to help you, and he will. Lord, we call on your help. We call on the name of Jesus for everyone watching today, everyone in the room today, for everyone across this nation Many, so many have quit. God, encourage them. Help them to strengthen the things that remain. For pastors, 42%, God, they're thinking of quitting. Once again, not just going to another church or another ministry, but quitting ministry altogether. God, strengthen us. Give us boldness and courage and faithfulness. For it's in your name I pray. Amen.